Thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm really uh, honored to be here to share in next 30 minutes cloud data engineering. As uh, was introduced, my name is Masama Zahid. I hope you can see my slides and you can see me as well. If there are any issues, can moderators can let me know if I'm audible and my slides are also visible. Yeah, we can see your slides and you as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. So let's begin. Uh, let's dive into the topic. I'll start with my introduction. Uh, my name is, as I mentioned, Mawasa Mazahid. I am a principal engineering manager at Microsoft Azure. I'm originally from Pakistan, Islamabad. I've been in the tech industry for over 13 years, which is a really long time. Uh, I'm super passionate about data, cloud computing, and AI. I've been a tech speaker. I have been volunteering at several organizations as I was introduced in Pakistani Women in Computing, which is a nonprofit. We have 12 plus global chapters and also volunteering at several other diversity, equity and inclusion efforts such as Anita BR, Women Who Code Cloud, Microsoft Women and Women in Azure. Uh, I was recently awarded a Mentor of the Year Award uh, by Women Tech Network, so really humbled and honored to get that award. And I also participate in a lot of activities as mentoring a lot of remote girls and men and women in areas in Nigeria, KPK, and Northern Pakistan and other areas as well. You can connect with me at uh, this link, and I'll be sharing my LinkedIn and Twitter also at the end. So if you have any questions which I cannot answer in the next 30 minutes, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll be more than happy to answer those questions. So let's start with why I actually chose this topic. So some of you might have already seen this slide or seen this uh, stats that has been shared around on the internet a lot these days. This is the amount of data that we are generating in every single minute, which means that uh, right now in this conference, we are live on YouTube, maybe on Facebook, on Microsoft Teams, we are generating a bunch of data. There's chat, there is video, there's a bunch of other things, right? It has been said and it has been there for over two years that data is the new oil, which means that this is the most important commodity available to us these days. I also love this saying by Kate, uh, who is the vice president of DreamWorks, which says that data is the new oil, AI is the new electricity, and IoT is the new nervous system. So how much data are we talking about? Let's talk about bits and bytes. So lots of you are developers, lots of you are uh, geeks, and you understand this very well. Right now, it is predicted by 2025, there is going to be 150 zettabytes of data. I will let that sink in. So which is 150 trillion gigabytes of data. It's three times of data that we have as of today. Just imagine that. That means that if we have that much data out there, and organizations and people and advertising and marketing and everything is generating so much data. We need that much data, people who understand the data to actually make sense of it, refine it, distill its value and get the gold out of it. So why I'm talking about cloud computing then? A lot of people ask me, where do I start? Terminologies like containers, serverless, IoT, hybrid cloud is really intimidating. But let's just start with the basics. So this is a very basic talk about introduction to cloud computing, how you actually start your journey in cloud computing and data engineering in cloud. So I would start with the definition of cloud computing. To me, cloud computing is simply put a set of hardware and software over the internet that you can connect to you can apply your software on, you can actually run your code on that, and then you can do something. For example, if you have an app today and you have 100 users and you want to scale that 100 users to 100,000 users, let's say there's a, there's a sale or something is coming up and you are imagining that, that you will have that many users on your app. If you were in a traditional on-premises world where you had to wait for a set of servers to arrive, it will take you three to six months to actually be able to support that kind of workload, to get them uh, connected, to get them connected over a network, to get your software installed, maybe a DBA is involved, maybe an admin is involved, a bunch of rules and access and things that you need to know. But in the world of cloud computing, you can do so with a click of few buttons and within a few minutes, you will have your app scaled from 100 users to 100,000 users, maybe way more than that. 
So that's very simple, oversimplified definition of how I put a cloud computing. If we want to dig deep into different types of services that are available in cloud computing, these are the four basic types. Before you dig deep into cloud computing, I would highly encourage you to actually understand the differences between this and decide which one is the best one for you and your job and your application or whatever you want to run in cloud. The very basic one and the very first one, which most of the cloud service providers actually introduced was infrastructure as a service, which is not anything but a set of machines which come with the default software. And then everything that runs on that, that machines is your responsibility. A good example of that would be Azure VMs, Amazon Web Services, EC2 machines, or Google machines. So you can just bring them up. There's like either Linux based, window based, whatever is your functionality. You go there over there, log into those, and then run whatever you want to run on those. So the cloud provider is only responsible for the infrastructure and making sure the infrastructure is available and you can connect to it. Everything else is your responsibility. The second one, which is, a, I would say, one of the most popular one is platform as a service. Where the cloud provider is actually providing you a bunch of services along with the hardware. That comes with it. A good example could be an RDPMS system where you have a relational database and you put your data in it, so you don't really need a DBA to actually do anything. They actually come with the default settings and everything. What you need is to make sure that you move your code, your data, whatever you need into that system. Good example of a PAP platform as a service could be HD Insight from Azure, which is a Hadoop service. It could be um, another example like MongoDB and other DBs that you can actually get as some of the service providers. The third one, a lot of us actually use it all the time, is software as a service. Microsoft Team is a great example of a software as a service where you actually download a software and you don't need to worry about anything which is happening behind. Just a fun fact for you, Teams actually runs on Microsoft Azure. So every time somebody is connected, there is Microsoft Azure backend that supports it. Google is also another example of that. So Google, uh, when you sign into emails, when you upload your pictures to your drive, that's actually a, another example. The third one, or the fourth one, which is actually gaining a lot of interest these days, a lot of people are moving towards this, is serverless compu computing or a function as a service. It's a talk in itself, maybe for a separate time, but this is a concept where you are not even worried about where it is running. You're not even worried about how to scale it, what to scale it. What you're worried about is just your code. Everything that that code does is the responsibility of the cloud service provider. So these are the four different basic types of services in, in cloud. And before you actually dig into any of the cloud computing platforms, it is important for you to understand what your service is, where it is, and who owns what piece of it. Another visual that will give you more explanation of that is this one. So if you move from left to right, in a non-premise world, if you have your own data center, for example, you would actually own everything. So everything in blue is your ownership. So somebody in your company is actually owning everything. But as you move from information from infrastructure as a service or containers as a service or platform or a function as a service, you will actually start losing the control of what you own and the cloud provider will actually have more ownership. But as you lose the ownership, what you gain is the scale and the speeds and feeds that you would not get in a non promise world. Please feel free to, re to leave any questions in the chat. I will leave last five to 10 minutes on, on the Q&A section and would like to answer those if you have any. So looking at the cloud computing world right now, in terms of market share, this is a slide again taken as of the snapshot of this, this year, 2020 June, and it will give you a good idea about who is who are the main players in this space. So these are the top eight main players in terms of the cloud services. Amazon Web Services is leading by 33% of the market share, followed by Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, Alibaba, IBM, Salesforce, Oracle, and others. And you can look at that number. That is the amount of revenue generated in terms of last year, just with the cloud services. That's $111 billion. 
it's not a million, it's a billion dollars. So there's a big, big, huge difference between million and billion. So I really highly encourage you to look into these technologies. If you're, let's say a startup, even if you're a big corporate, it can save you a lot of money also, it can save you a lot of time also, and it can actually make some of your processes really good. So let's talk about some of the basic concepts before you actually start your cloud journey. Again, I'm oversimplifying it here, but I divide it into just four basic concepts. It's true for a non-premise world as well, but as you move to cloud, it's really, really, really important for you as a dev or a lead or a manager or a tech lead or whoever your role is to understand how these things work in the cloud world. So the four concepts are compute, storage, network, and security. Compute, what I mean by compute is a set of machines, is your CPUs, GPUs, all of that. How much compute you need to actually do the work that you want to do. It's very simple how I'm defining it, but when you actually are solving a problem, there are so many different ways of doing it in cloud and every single day there are new services coming in. So it's really, really important for you to understand that. Second, with compute, you have a bunch of data. We were talking about data and this talk is related to data engineering, data science, and I've been a data engineer, data scientist since my first job out of college. So really, really passionate about that. So where do you store that data? There are again, as I said, hundreds of different types of data storage available. You can store in cold storage, you can store in a real-time database, you can store in SQL, you can store in NoSQL, and there are so many options. Then the third thing is how do you connect all of this? Really, really important, right? If you have computer and you have storage, but you don't know how to connect to it and what's the best way to connect to it, there's no real, real actually usage of that. So understanding the networking principles around that, how these different services work in cloud is again really important for you to understand. And last but not least is security. It's important in an on-premise world or your own data center to be secure, but once you move to cloud, it's actually three times, 10 times, I would say 100 million times more important to secure your jobs, secure applications, secure whatever you're running in cloud. And a lot of customers that I work with, uh, they don't think about it. They think if they move the applications as it is, it's secured in the cloud. It's not. You have to really, really make sure that you write your code and protect your code in a way by using the right networking principles, by using the right uh, encryptions, by using the right keys and other ways to actually secure this if you're going to cloud. So just try to understand how these things work in cloud. And I would share some of the resources at the end for you to start your cloud journey also. Moving on, we'd like to give you some examples of applications that you that are currently running in cloud. A lot of you are already using them all the time, but you don't know how they're built. And they're all actually data engineering problems. And they're running at a huge, huge scale in cloud right now. One of the most common one is anomaly detection. So if let's say I'm based here in Seattle and all of a sudden my credit card is used in Kenya or somewhere, I would get a fraud alert in a few minutes, if not seconds, that somebody is trying to access your credit card. How does the financial institution actually knows about it? They have built a good data pipeline on the data of every transaction that's going in and out. And they are scaling it at a huge scale in cloud, whatever cloud provider they're using, to make sure that they can detect it in time and actually take action. Another great example of that is connected cars. A lot of cars here in the US, in Europe, and in, in other places, and even Pakistan, have these mobile apps where you can actually start the car even remotely as well. So at the back end, that's actually generating a bunch of data. There's a connectivity between your app to the cloud provider back to your physical device, which is a car. It's another great example of a data engineering solution that's been built on cloud. The third one, which is my favorite, and I think Rahil was mentioning it as well, with the Alexas and Siri's and Cortana's and Google Home and all of these smart devices that we all have in our hands all the time or in our homes, they are all super, super, super smart. And they are all near real time. So for example, my daughter goes to Alexa and says, Alexa, what's the weather today? It doesn't take 10 minutes for Alexa to answer. It doesn't take like 20 minutes or one hour to answer. 
within a minute or less than a minute, Alexa gets back, even in some cases, a few seconds, that the weather here in Seattle is this. How does Alexa know that I'm talking about Seattle? How does Alexa know where to get this information within a few seconds? So it's actually a data pipeline built behind it that solves that problem. And one of the common examples that a lot of you do, I spend a bunch of time in online shopping, especially in COVID days, is, is let's say going on Amazon or wherever you want to shop, right? You go there, you buy stuff, and the recommendation systems over there are really, really smart. They know what I like. They know if I buy something, what else would, would actually make sense to buy with it. And all of this is actually AI models, recommender models that are built into a bunch of data that's been fed into it about myself to know what I'm going to do and what actions I'm going to take next. So these are some good examples, and there are like hundreds of other great examples of cloud data engineering that has been done at a huge scale. You can actually build a solution today with your existing app in cloud. If not, if not like a few hours in a few days. It's really, really that easy. And as Rahil was saying before me, there's nothing stopping us. There's nothing stopping you today to start your journey. Start your journey of learning, start a journey in cloud, start your journey in learning the technologies of the future. So I'm going to talk about one of the common architectures that is used in these cloud data engineering pipelines. Again, this talk is very basic and introductory, and I'm oversimplifying some of the concepts here, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions if you have afterwards. So all of the cloud data pipelines actually start with source systems, right? We all have data stored somewhere. Some companies have stored in Excel sheet, some companies have CRM systems, some companies have uh, databases. Whatever is your source that's generating data, it could be an IoT sensor also, right? That's where you start your cloud data pipelines. You start generating a bunch of data. From that point, you have two ways to go. And that will actually depend on what is the problem that you're solving. This architecture that I'm showing you is called Lambda architecture, and it is one of the most common ways of how cloud data pipelines are built. And you can read about it just by typing Lambda architecture on Google or Bing or wherever you search for. So there you have two options. You can go with the near real time route, where if let's say you want to do um, alert on something, any anomaly detection, the example that I just gave, you have to actually know in near real time something is happening. So technologies like Kafka, technologies like Event Hubs, technologies like any of the bus type platforms where you have messages coming in at like billions or millions of transactions per second, you will store that there. And then you have technologies like Spark Streaming, things like that that are running on top of that and actually knowing and doing anomaly detection, things like that. So you need some kind of stream processing after that. This path is really expensive because you want to take actions quick, right? So this path is expensive. The storage is expensive. You need more compute. You need more power to actually solve this. But let's say you can you can wait for a day to get any of the results in your pipelines. Then you don't have to do this. So a lot of customers can just start with a cold storage, a data storage in some kind of database or a storage like S3 in Amazon or data lake storage in Azure and others. So you go that route on the top, which is more of a slower path than the than the path on the bottom. And you can do batch processing. A lot of companies still do BI reports, year over year kind of analysis, batch processing, and they store the data in some kind of analytical data store like SQL Data Warehouse or Redshift in Amazon, or you can use a third party like Snowflake. And last but not least, you need some kind of reporting on front of it to see those pretty diagrams and see what's really going on in your business. So these, again, I've oversimplified it here, touched a bunch of things, a lot of technologies, names there. But starting with one or two technologies in this pipeline would be a good starting point to understand how you can build a good comprehensive data pipeline in cloud. Some of this is actually orchestrated by a bunch of tools like Azure Data Factory or Amazon Glue, where you actually don't even know, need to know any coding. You can drag and drop different components, connect them, and there you go. You have a good cloud computing kind of data pipeline up and running. Or you can use third party open source software like Apache Li-Fi. And you can build these pipelines over there super fast without even knowing any coding. You just need to know how to use that UI and how to actually connect these different things. 
So when you're building these things, what are the top considerations? First and foremost is the DevOps. How do you deploy these things? CI/CD pipelines. You don't want to manual deployments. You don't want any upgrades to be done by somebody on the weekend and doing left clicks here and there. A lot of these cloud providers actually come with a bunch of tooling. For example, Azure DevOps, um, AWS has, has uh, cloud formation and others that you can use. And, and a lot of automation that you can, or you can use third party like Chef or Jenkins and others to actually do this. Security and networking, I cannot emphasize enough on that. That could be a talk in itself for some other time. It's really, really important for you to understand those concepts. So when you are defining the network security groups, the IAM rules, whatever cloud provider, whichever you are using, it's really important for you to set that up in the right way so that you don't get hacked once you go live. And you know that that's a very common thing that happens to the most sophisticated networks out there. The other thing that a lot of developers or companies actually forget about is high availability and disaster recovery. What if the data center in which you're deploying actually goes down? Something really bad happens there. Your application should be resilient to such updates, anything that's actually falling, failing over there. And again, depending on how critical is that application, let's say if you're building a solution for a healthcare system and somebody's life is actually dependent on that, like 911 or something like that, you have to make sure that that solution is highly, highly, highly resilient. If something goes down, you have a backup there up and running in a few seconds. And cloud computing again has, or every cloud provider actually has a bunch of principles and guidelines around that. The other things, of course, you need to know is speeds and feeds, like how many users you have, how much speed, how much data you're storing, where you're storing, where it's coming from, all of that. And a lot of developers actually forget this is cost. With cloud computing, as I said, the scale is really, really easy. But with that scale, you can actually cost your company a lot of money as well if you don't understand how these work. So keep an eye on the cost and also build good monitoring solutions around whatever you have deployed. So you can get alerted if something goes down. Some of the key skills of the future related to this, uh, SQL is not going anywhere away. So if you have SQL skills, definitely that's useful. But in addition to that, a lot of lab programming languages in the data space are now dependent on Python, Node.js type applications. Any of the ETL orchestration type tools that I mentioned before, if you have that knowledge, that's really useful. Hadoop ecosystem tons of big data. Again, it's still useful, it's still relevant. I know it's six years, seven years old. There was a big hype of that. It's kind of settled down now, but a lot of companies are still using it. So if you're just starting off, I would still encourage you to look into that. So technologies like Apache Spark, Apache Kafka, they're really, really, really right now in the spotlight. So if you have those scales, it's really, really high in demand. You will get employed very fast as well. And then data governance, how do you do? What do you do with this data? What do you do and how do you actually make sense of it? So a lot of tooling and things are available. So that kind of concludes my presentation. I have a bunch of online resources and, and things that I want to share. I, I'll keep that uh, slides for a few seconds. So if you want to take a screenshot, I know these are recorded so you can come back to it. These are some of the online resources or courses that you can take to know more about cloud computing, starting your cloud journey, look at the cloud basics over there. Cloudacademy.com is a great website. LinkedIn Learning, uh, Coursera, of course. There are a lot of, lot of online resources today. And again, there's nothing stopping you to go and learn those. A lot of people actually look into certifications. So that's also a great way to start your cloud journey. And these are on the left side are the top certifications that are in the cloud world. And on the right side, I mentioned some of the guides that you can actually take to learn more about these certifications and learn them or get yourself trained on them. I will leave you with this slide, which is kind of a summary. And if there is one thing you take out of this is how and what is your role as a data engineer, data scientist, data analyst, or business analyst in the company is to connect those data points, connect them, make sense of them, connect them to knowledge, insight, wisdom, and eventually make an impact in your company. Don't think that if you can write the best code, you'll always succeed. It's important for you to understand what is the business problem that you're solving and how can your data solution solve that problem. So if you can do that, then you've done your job. So again, thank you so much for having me.
Uh, the moderators can tell me we have a couple of minutes to answer any questions. This is my LinkedIn, Twitter and Medium where I blog. If you want to reach out to me, feel free to do that and um, can take a few questions if there are any. Uh, yes, Mosma, we got two questions. So the first one is how can one join Big Five if he she is from Pakistan? What's easiest route to it? Yeah, I think that's a common question these days uh, because of recent visa issues and things like that. A lot of companies are not hiring internationally and especially this year with COVID, you know, that has been on a stop. Uh, but I know a lot of folks, even in Microsoft, Google and other Facebook, they actually used to do hiring in Pakistan before that. So one easiest way could be wait for it. So if things get better in the future, uh, that that could be that. I know in Pakistan, the startup ecosystem is really, really moving. In the last two years, there is a lot of great work happening. A lot of venture capital is actually investing in Pakistan. So you can earn a lot of uh, great skills being in Pakistan right now. But if your actual target is to get to one of these big five uh, companies, um, then maybe not in the US, you can start in Europe or Middle East and eventually get to it. Right. Uh, again, visa is a big issue these days, so uh, that would be my suggestion on that to look into some intermediate, get the skill set, get your training, get ready for it, and then eventually get to the point when once the visa issues and things get resolved. Um, I don't think the problem is with the skill set from Pakistan. A lot of great folks like me and others that I know here are from Pakistan, and uh, I, I'm really hopeful that things get better in the future. Thank you. So the next question is. Yes. What about a year service fabric does it and comes under a year computer services? If yes, then how? Yeah, it comes under uh, Azure a computer service in a, in a, I would say, an umbrella of that. Uh, it is a combination of a compute and network because it's a bunch of compute connected together. Uh, you can learn uh, if you just go to Azure Compute uh, and then go to the blogs over there. You can learn way more about the workings of it and how it's connected, what it does. Um, a lot of internal Azure services is actually dependent on the service fabric as well because we actually have to scale and we actually have to um, make sure that these compute and stuff is actually available. So uh, it's an umbrella, I would say, between compute and network. Right, so there's another one. Hi, Muzma. It was a nice talk. Thanks for it. You touched the word security that we still have to protect our applications. Being still in the cloud, although we get to hear the claims of security from cloud services provides. So my question is, what's the type of security the cloud service providers provide us? Just curious to know. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, thank you, Majid, uh, for that question. So I will give you an example, let's say, of storage, right? So storage by default comes with encryption. Uh, so even if you don't do anything uh, in any of these cloud service providers, it comes with a basic level of encryption. But let's say if you're storing personal identifiable data in it, like PII data in it, then it's there is a lot of compliance that's up to the customer to make sure that they tag the data correctly and store it in the right way. A lot of common mistakes that companies or people do when they're moving to cloud is in their code bases. For example, in their automation, there are actually keys and stuff stored in the code. So they can get really, really easily hacked if somebody gets to their code. So if you're if one of the very easiest thing to do is first foremost thing, make sure none of your code base has any of your passwords or keys or anything like that. Second thing what you can do is make sure any of, as I'm talking the data contacts, any of the assets that you have, you label them correctly. That's why data governance comes into picture. And make sure if you have any PII data or any of the other data, like if let's say in your, if you work with Europe, then there is a lot of GDPR where you have to delete the data every three months and six months period, right? So if you don't know and you are not doing enough audits on your data, then there are actually other issues that can cause and there will be compliance issues. So in terms of security, a lot of cloud providers come with a lot of basic security and they're, they're the defaults. 
But beyond those defaults, uh, anything that you are doing in terms of your code and application is up to the company's responsibility. A lot of these cloud providers actually have uh, consultants that can help you and they will. There's a lot of guides and architecture principles and things that you can look into at. Uh, but uh, security don't never ever ever take that with the word whoever is saying that to you that we are highly secure and you don't have to do anything. No, make sure that you make sure what you're bringing to cloud is actually secure in terms of the code and application as well. Beyond what the cloud provider is saying. So the last one is here. How cloud computing helps the automatic engineer in script writing things? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think uh, depending on what you use for your automation uh, currently scripting, uh, there is a lot of automation tools that are available in cloud. For example, in, in, uh, in Azure, as I said, Azure DevOps has a lot of integrations. Terraform is a third party. There's a lot of integration existing right now. Uh, if you go with the traditional world, those are the technologies you will use. Or if you go in, um, let's say, Amazon Web Services, you will use CloudFormation with Jenkins or some other tooling around it, right? How cloud providers are actually helping you is providing easy plugins where you can plug and play with different components as resources and you can deploy it in a large scale. So that's what they provide you. What you have to again bring in your code and make sure that works on the cloud provider. Or you can use a third party like Terraform. Um, as I mentioned very briefly on the other side of things, a container as a service, um, that's another area that's gaining a lot of interest. So if you have Kubernetes knowledge, you would uh, like it's really the skill of the future right now. So all of the internal deployments are actually using Kubernetes and that's kind of another future where, where you can invest some time. So if you're an automation engineer, I would highly encourage you to look at containers. I would highly encourage you to look at the container solutions that some of these cloud providers actually provide. And some of them are really plug like plug and play. So you basically use your code, you build that container and then there is an image that you can go and deploy anywhere at any scale. And, and for example, AKS service, which is Azure Kubernetes service, you can have n numbers of parts and you can just scale up and scale down at any point in time as long as you have that container that's available. Thank you so much. That was the last question. Thank you, Muzma, for sharing your knowledge with us. And over to you, Madhya. Please Thank you continue. so much for having me. Bye. Bye. Take care.